أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فهو المهتدي ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا الحمد لله القائل وقل رب زدني علما والصلاة والسلام على من أرسله ربه معلما وبشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على سيدنا ونبينا ومولانا محمد الذي علمنا وطهرنا وزكانا ودلنا على رياض الجنة ورياض الصالحين اللهم اجعلنا منهم يا أكرم الأكرمين آمين Respected brothers and sisters Welcome to our weekly Riyadh al-Salihin class Alhamdulillah we are about to complete volume 1 and then very soon we will start volume 2 inshallah a great book by Al-Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah and who has done a great job in explaining the ilm of Imam al-Ghazali. Rahimahullah. You need to know that Imam al-Nawawi, who is a Shafi'i, by the way, he follows Imam uh, Muhammad ibn Idris Shafi'i in, in his madhab. So he's a Shafi'i who explained another Shafi'i alim who is Imam Abu Hamid al Ghazali. May Allah have mercy on all our ulama, whether they were Hanafis or Malikis or Shafi'is or Hanbalis, they are all following the Sunnah of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and their differences of opinions is Rahmah to the Ummah because they differ about furu'. They differ about branches of the deen. They don't differ about usul al-deen. Usul al-deen such as Aqeedah, they don't differ. They differ only, for example, if uh, Dua al-Qunut is wajib in Salat al-Subh or not. If saying Ameen loudly for Fajr and Maghrib and Isha and Taraweeh and this and that, or silently, that's how they differ. They don't differ about big things such as, are there malaika or not? Is there a day of judgment or not? Is there paradise or not? No alim will ever differ about those things. But they will differ, for example, should uh, a married woman who has been divorced or widowed to have a wali, for her second or third or fourth marriage? Or, no, this is where Abu Hanifa said no. Abu Hanifa is with the opinion that a married woman who has already been married and doesn't have to have wali when it comes to her second marriage or third or whatever marriage, after she has already been married with a wali first time. Why I'm exposing you to this thing? So that you know that ilm is more than what you have been exposed to in your local uh, uh, way of life, whether it's Malaysia or Algeria or Mali or uh, Bosnia-Herzegovina or Pakistan or India or Turkey or Saudi Arabia. The fiqh is bigger than culture. That's why every student of knowledge who is sincere about Islamic knowledge should learn also al-fiqh al-muqaran, comparative fiqh, comparative jurisprudence, so that when <clears throat> a case, a fatwa, a question is addressed to him or her, he knows how to answer because the fatwa is all about solving people's problems. Fatwa is not to make 
a problem more problematic. If someone comes to Sheikh Zubair for a question, I should make his life easy, give him an answer, not make it more difficult for him or her to practice the deen. Unfortunately, many people today think the more difficult you make it for them, the greater the Sheikh you are. While the Sharia spirit is all about the opposite, which is taysir. What is taysir? Is. Aisha radiallahu anha, our beloved mother, may Allah be pleased with her, said, Ma khuyira Rasulullahi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallama bayna amrayni illa akhtara aysarahuma. Whenever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam had to choose between two things, he will choose what is easy. I'll give you an example. When he traveled, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he could fast. He used to fast five days continuously without drinking even a sip of water. Five consecutive days. At Maghrib, he doesn't break. At Sahur, he doesn't take any Sahur for five days. Yet when he traveled, he chose to eat so that his ummah does not find it difficult on themselves when they travel after him to eat if they cannot fast. So he had the choice to fast during the journey when he's fasting or to break. He did choose to break <coughs> so that he makes it easy for us, inshallah. All right, having said that, any question before we start? Bismillah. Any question? Many of you are still in the mood of Hari Raya. You think I cannot take one month off? Look at me, huh? Hari Raya still teaching. Takbir. Any question? Sister Zurina, Sister Shariza, Sister Uznaini, Sister Fazlina, Sister Asmi, Sister Alina. Bismillah, go ahead. Any question? General question. <coughs> no? Okay. Yalla, open your books. Page 585. Just to remind one another what we said last time, that it is prohibited to take a wild animal's skin, such as tigers or lions or wolves or foxes, wild animals. You cannot take them, you cannot take their, 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 their what you call it, skin and sleep over them. Coat maybe, if there is cold, if it's too cold and you need to cover yourself with fur of, uh, of, of a deer, let it be. But you are just going to put it on the floor so that people think, wow, what's that? Or hang it on a wall. No. How about animals that we can eat? Horses, sheep, goats, cows, bulls, buffaloes, can. Animals that you can eat, you can use their skin on the floor for salad, for sajada, but not animals you cannot eat. The animals you cannot eat are the carnivores, meaning the animals that eat meat. You cannot use their skin on the floor or on the wall to decorate. But out of survival, you are too cold and you need to put something fine. Not as a luxury, pay attention. Not as a luxury. There is only that skin of that tiger right there. And I need to cover myself because it's very cold until I find 
a suitable jacket. Is that okay, Sheikh? That's fine because that's necessity. But on the floor for luxury, huh? that is not right. You need to know that. Okay, that's where we stopped last time. Last time we studied Riyadh Salihin, that's where we stopped. So now we move to chapter 117. Is everybody there? <clears throat> okay, who has the book? Sister Zurina, you go first. Chapter 117. What, sure. do you, uh, what do you say as a Muslim when you wear something new? When you wear, especially like most of us, alhamdulillah, in the Eid, we have put new clothes. What to say? Yes? Anyone has question? Yes? Who wanted to ask? Go ahead. Nobody. Okay. Yalla, sister Zorina, go ahead. Bismillah rahman rahim Chapter 117, about the invocation a Muslim should use upon wearing new clothing or footwear. 401, narrated Abu Sa'id, radiallahu wa anhu, whenever the messenger of Allah Wasallam had a new garment, he used to name it. For example, a turban or a shirt and say, Oh Allah, praise belongs to you. You have caused me to wear this. I asked you the good of it and the good in making it. And I seek refuge with you from the evil of it and the evil in making it. Atanizi. Excellent. When you put something like Sheikh Zubair, let's say put Sonko. I should mention the Sonko, praise Allah, Alhamdulillah, and ask Allah, oh Allah, I ask you the goodness of this Sonko and the goodness that was made for. And I seek refuge in you from the evil of this Sonko and the evil that, may, that was, that when, when this was made, there was an evil made with it. Could be evil eye, could be, could be, I don't know what, who, where this person got this, uh, making it. I bought it, but if, when I bought it from that guy, where did he get it from? The factory that made it, was it sponsored by a bank through Riba Loan? You know what I mean? You don't know. Your money is halal, definitely. You bought something halal, alhamdulillah. But that sonko or that jubba or that bajumlayu or whatever you are wearing, even if it is turban. So this is sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that we need to, insha'Allah, <coughs> make dua. Allahumma inni as'aluka خيرها وخير ما صنعت له وأعوذ بك من شرها وشر ما صنعت له والله praise be praise all praises belong to you you have caused me to wear this sonko or bajumlayu or tuxedo or whatever or shoes uh, or bags sisters when you buy a bag be careful and I ask you the good of it and the good in making it. And I seek refuge with you from the evil of it and the evil in making it. Halas, is this clear, inshallah? So from now on, you say this dua. Even in Malay, it's okay. When you wear something new. Is this clear? Very good. You see Islam? You see Rasulullah says, even teaching us what to say when we wear something. MashaAllah. Brother Azmi, next chapter, chapter 118. <clears throat> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Book of the new manner of sleeping. Chapter 118, about the manner of sleeping and reclining. Uh, 402, narrated Al-Bara Ibn Azib, whenever Allah's Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went to bed, he used to sleep on his right side and then say, Allahumma aslamtu nafsi ilaika, 
wa wajatu wajhi ilaika wa fatu amri ilaika wal jatu zahri ilaika raghbatan wa rahbatan ilaika la maljan wa la manja minka illa ilaika amantu bi kitabika bikal ladhi anzalta wa nabika alladhi Oh Allah, I have submitted my soul to you. I have turned my face towards you. I have confined my affairs to you. I have left my back to your protection out of fear and hope in you. There is neither resort nor delivery from you except to you. I believe in the book you have sent down. I believe in your prophet whom you have sent. Allah messenger, Allah's messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, whoever recite these words before going to bed and dies the same night he will die on al fitrah the islamic religion as a muslim alhamdulillah whoever says this dua if you die you die on the fitrah you go to jannah this dua is a big dua i leave it up to you to try to memorize it it's written in arabic and in transliteration and it is translated in english for you to understand the meaning this dua if you ever say it before bed and you die in your bed masha allah you are from ahl al jannah by the grace and and mercy of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala no need to repeat the same dua is hadith 403 404 up to 405 thank you now we go to sister shariza with chapter 119 chapter 119 five, eight, nine. page 5 chapter 119 about the permissibility of lying on the back placing one leg on the other provided one is covering one's aura Um, Abdullah ibn Zaid al-Ansari radiallahu anhu narrated that he has seen the Prophet sallallahu lying flat on his back in the mosque, putting one of his legs over the other, Bukhari. Very narrated, good. Continue. Narrated, narrated ibn, ibn Umar, I saw Allah's messenger sallallahu alayhi wa in the courtyard of the Kaaba in al-ihtiba al uh, posture, putting his arms around his legs like this, Bukhari. Yeah, so I showed you last time from Mecca, al mukarrama when I was in the hotel teaching this class, how Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam lay, lay down on his back and put one leg over the other one, as long as the aura is covered. As long as someone is wearing trouser, even ladies, you wear trouser while wearing your jubba, same thing for men. Can I put one leg over the other one while I'm relaxing? There is nothing wrong with that. But women shouldn't be seen by men. Men should be seen by men, and women should be seen by women. Is this clear? Inshallah. So <clears throat> two Sahaba narrates the hadith. It's not just one. Abdullah ibn Zaid al-Ansari, radiallahu anhu, saw Rasulullah sallallahu in Medina doing so. And Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu anhuma saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa doing that in Mecca, in Masjid al-Haram. He was lying down in front of the Kaaba and he was putting one leg over the other one. Provided the aura is covered. So there is nothing wrong to relax when you are tired in Islam. Okay? Very good. Ask me as I explain, as I explain, you ask me. Okay, this is where we stopped. Adab al Majlis. Now, manners of sitting with one's companions. When you're sitting with people, how should you sit? Very important. Many Muslims, tida ada adab, you know, when they sit, they may uh, pull their legs towards your face. They may give you their back, not face you. They may, <coughs> I don't know. So Islam showed us how to sit when you are with people. 
let's see that with Sister Azlina. Chapter 120. Okay, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam rahmatullah. Okay, chapter 120 about the manners of sitting with one's companions. Uh, narrated Ibn Omar, the Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, said, Let not one of you request his brother to leave his place and then he sits in it. Uh, number 409, narrated Ibn Omar. Oh, Ibn Omar May Allah be pleased with them. The Prophet وسلم, said, a man should not make another man get up from his seat in a gathering to sit in it, but one should make room and spread out. Very good. Uh, Stop there. In Islam, can I come and ask you to leave this seat? No. Especially in the masjid. Pay attention to this. If someone has ever come and sat in a place, you have no right to tell him to move unless he is sitting in the imam's place. In the imam's place, somebody came and sat in the imam's place. We can tell him, brother, we're going to pray, please come. Then he has to, but not in any other place. Today, I see some very ridiculous things being done. Some people walk in and tell the first row to go back. Why? Because somebody important ruler is coming with his, uh, I don't know, group of people. Huh? Group of people, entourage, they want that place. No, I came first and I'm sitting here. You have no right to tell me to get up so that you sit in my place. And this is the house of Allah. And among all the places in the world, listen to me carefully. No one has authority in the house of Allah except Allah. Do you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? In the house of Allah, there is no authority for anyone except Allah. In the house of Allah, any house of Allah, any masjid, the authority belongs to Allah. So no one has the right to tell you, don't sit here. Move here. Don't come here. This masjid is only for Pakistanis. This masjid is only for the Malays. This masjid is only for the Turks. It's haram. The message belongs to Allah. And we are all slaves and servants of Allah. One more thing. No matter who you may be in terms of titles, we know who you are in reality. You are a dirty sperm that touch an egg. Then you are a human being full of poop right now as we speak. All of us have poop in our intestines. And we will stink like hell if they don't bury us after 24 hours. This is who we are. Whether we are kings, CEOs, prime ministers, datins, tansaris, but uh, we are zero. Let's say Sheikh Zubair is the Sultan of Malaysia. When I come to the house of Allah, that title, I should put it with my shoes and walk in. If I want Allah to forgive me, if I want Allah to have mercy on me, especially Sakarat al maut look at them, how they die. If I want Allah to have mercy on me when time comes, when no doctors can help me, all my wealth, all my entourage, all my army, nothing can help. <coughs> when I come to the house of Allah, I'm like anybody else. I drop my sandals or what my 50,000 US dollar shoe, and I walk with humility and humbleness to the house of Allah, begging him to forgive me and accept whatever good I have done. Otherwise, 
big problem. Big problem. So then you are sitting in the um, first row, people come and say, and then you say, what is it? They said, no, you have to come. Come what? I don't come out. It's the house of Allah, I'm with, 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 with God. Big problem. Big problem. So now back to our subject, which is how to sit down with people. Never ever tell someone to get up for you to sit down or for someone else to sit down. Somebody is already sitting. You tell him, come, let so-and-so sit. Yes. No, very good. How about the child? We tell a child to get up so that we let an adult sit. No, we don't do that either. Because that child, if he's sitting in the house of Allah, we are teaching him somehow that you are nothing. No, we should say. So what's the solution? Make space. Make space. Let's say my, my son is sitting near me. I will pull my son and put him on my lap to make seat for an adult. But I will not tell my son, go back. Then the son will never come back to the masjid again. But instead, we make space so that somebody sits. And Rasulullah suggested that. Not suggested, he told us to do that. He said, make space. But don't let someone get up for somebody else. Not good. I make space for you. I don't give you my seat. Especially if you ask. If you ask, I don't give. How about that? You are now, most of you thinking, no, the adab is the other way. We think adab, out of adab I give. No. No. This is not taxi. This is not uh, LRT. This is not bus. This is not trained for me to give you my seat. I see you a pregnant woman, or I see you an old man or old woman, I give you my seat. This is masjid. This is house of Allah. This is class like this. Halaqa ilmu. People listening to the Sheikh, they came early. Make someone get up for someone else who came late. Sit wherever you are. Who told you to come late? Baham, what I am talking about. I'm not talking about giving you my seat because you are very old or sick or handicapped or pregnant woman or no. I'm talking about masjid, class, ilmu. Allah says, the prophet says, the sheikh is explaining. You come from far to take uh, the first seat. Why? And there is hadith. Authentic command of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Duduk, wherever you find a place. Wherever you find a space, sit. But don't push people, uh, people's neck, people are sitting and you start, so that you go and sit somewhere. Very wrong to do that. Some people do that during Jumu'ah. During Jumu'ah. Not because there is space. Sometimes the, the stuff is full. Lurus kan, rapat kan. But people still push. That is not right. When there is space walk, but when there is no space. And in Malaysia, you find plenty of space. The Malays don't like to sit near each other, shoulder to shoulder. You know why? Because you like islands. You all live on islands. So you like to be. Somebody has a question. Raise your voice so that your sisters can hear you. If we are in SAF, if we are in the SAF, and then there's a space near us, but people in the back SAF, they don't want to move to the empty space. 
can we then ask them, encourage them, or ask them really to fill up the space near us because we are in the front side? Ladies, ladies or men? Ladies. So the first row is empty, you mean? The, the row where we are in, so like in Masjid al Haram that day, ah. are, we are in rows. And then, you know, when we stand up, there are empty spaces. Mm. But some people, because they are already in the row behind us where they are, they park themselves there, even though they see empty spaces in front of them, in the no. staff in front of yeah, them, not... they don't want to move. Yeah, but Can don't tell. ask them to move? No, you move. Yeah. You move. Look at me. You may tell someone to come near you, but you don't tell someone to move and you don't move. Masjid, masjid. If there is a row empty or one or two spaces, you walk into that. Allah will give you pahala. Why should I let you walk there? I get, I want to pahala. So, in front of us is full. Our row. Our road is empty. So only the Oh, you can tell that. people to come. Yes. Ah, okay. It, okay. Sister Farina is saying, in her rows, she told other ladies to come near her. Is that okay? Yeah, that's fine. That is salat. You are not going to sit in the salat. You're going to stand and pray. We're talking about like now, listening to Sheikh Zubair, somebody comes and tell you, get up, I want to sit. I am thinking wild ideas are coming to my mind what to tell that guy, but then I don't want to say. Bole, any question now, ask me. <clears throat> Don't let me go 300 kilometers and then bring me back to. Yeah, sister is talking about Masjid Haram, Masjid Nabawi, because she comes from Umrah, so she's still, mashallah, there. Somebody is lying down and resting. Leave him alone. It's not salat time. If it's salat time, get up, get them up. Somebody could be in itikaf, Masjid al Haram, last ten days. Resting. Leave him or her alone. But when adhan comes and the person still snoring, no, wake them up gently. Salam alaikum, salah. And they have to renew wudu. They have to renew the wudu. So uh, uh, help them to get up during the adhan. Okay. And don't say, well, the adhan was there. How can he not hear? Some people, their sleep is super heavy. That they hibernate. They don't, just don't sleep. So you get to wake them up. And Allah will reward. Ladies, wake up, ladies. And men, wake up, men. Okay? All right. I have yeah. a question. Yes. So, in that in that case, if somebody comes to you and tell you to move, so what do you what do you say? To move, to move where? I mean, to to move out of your space. Yeah. If somebody comes to you, you uh -huh. are the recipient. Yeah. So, yeah. what do you say? Uh, okay. Is it salat or dars? Um. Okay, just say, say in a majlis, not necessarily in salat. Majlis. I think salat okay. people are a bit more, you know, no, even they have when, adapt. No, even when they tell you move, maybe they are asking you to move to a space, space between two sisters. They're asking you to move. That's why I said, is it salat or majlis? Okay, just say if it's in majlis. Okay, if they ask you to move, say no. But <laughs> make space. Listen, no, say no. Ta'mahu. Okay. And then you say you want to sit, I make space. But to move out for you or for anybody, sorry, I'm okay, tell them. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you. Yes. No, you have to let people know. If they say, why? They say Rasulullah said, do not make a person stand out of his seat. Unless you are blocking way or you are sitting on people's, you know, going, going, that's different. I'm talking people like now, let's say you are around me. You are around Sheikh Zubair. Somebody comes and say, I want to sit in this place. Sheikh Zubair will rotate on him or her. 
because tidak ada adab of majlis. Rasulullah SAW is saying don't do that, and we are doing that. Hmm. Again, Sister Farina still in the mood of, of traveling. She said, husband and wife traveling together, but separate seats. Can we ask people to move out so that we sit? Pay attention to this. This is not majlis of ilmu. This is traveling, you request. Uh, excuse me, ma'am, excuse me, sir. Can I please, can you change with me the position because this is my wife, I would like to sit near her, if, if you don't mind. If they say fine, Fine, thank them. If they say no, don't get upset. Because most probably it's not them who have chosen that place. It happened to us when we were coming back from Umrah. They put me on one seat and my wife on another seat. What did we do? We just requested nicely. Would you please accept? Alhamdulillah, they, they, they were nice. May Allah reward them. This is, this is traveling. This is plane or bus or ship or taxi or but no problem. Are we talking majlis of ilmu or majlis of dhikr? You don't tell, don't do that to people. Okay? And we, we, those who are sitting, we should, we should, uh, um, let people also, for example, I see a man with his son and the son is taking care of his dad. Here, no problem. I can walk away and let the son sit near his dad because he's taking care of him. His father is old, he takes care of him, no problem. But somebody comes and tap your shoulder. Hey, I don't want you to sit here. I want to sit here. Tell him, a'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajim Get out or I'm gonna run over you. Yalla, leave me alone. Don't add to my problems. Already have full cup. Faham? Okay. Continue. Sister Fazlina, one more hadith. Okay, hadith <coughs> 410. Um, narrated Salman al Farisi, radiallahu anhu. The Prophet وسلم, said, Whoever takes a bath on Friday, purifies himself as much as he can, then uses his hair oil or perfumes himself with the scent available to him, then proceeds for the Friday prayer and does not separate two persons sitting together in the mosque, then prays as much as Allah has written for him and then remains silent while the Imam delivers the Friday sermon his sins in between the present and the last Friday would be forgiven. Allahu Bukhari. All your sins will be forgiven if you do on Friday what the Prophet said. You take shower, ghusl, you put your best clothes, you put the best perfume you have, and you walk to the masjid or go to the masjid by riding or whatever, it's okay. But you do not separate two Muslims. Meaning whatever you find space, you go. Two brothers shoulder to shoulder or two sisters shoulder to shoulder, you tell them, give me space. And you pray as much as Allah allows you, meaning nafl, until the adhan of, of Jumu'ah. You stop and you listen to the Imam without talking, without speaking. You are forgiven, you know, all your sins between last Jumu'ah and this Jumu'ah are forgiven. Alhamdulillah. Imagine a Muslim does this every Jumu'ah. Does he meet Allah with sins? No. All his or her sins are forgiven. One sad thing really here about Malaysia is that women don't go to Jumu'ah. Not only they are not encouraged, they are not allowed. It's so weird. Pretty much everywhere in the world, Muslim sisters go to Salat al-Jumu'ah. Go to Salat al-Jumu'ah. When it comes to Malaysia, maybe Indonesia too, women don't go. I don't know why. I don't know why. It's not right. 
If there is anyone to teach in this ummah, it should be the women, the females. Because the females are the first, the prime caretaker of the children. Imagine this woman is jahil. She doesn't know much because she doesn't attend classes. She doesn't go to Juma either. Then the children will become very weak because the mother is the first teacher. Imagine our young girls attend Jumu'a and they are encouraged every Jumu'a until they get married, until they get children, they become mothers, they become great grandmothers. MashaAllah, the Ummah will be so strong because they have learned something, they pass it on to the children. Thank you, Sister Fazlina. Sister Asmi, 411. <coughs> Asmi Kamal, are you there? Coming, coming, coming here. Okay. Okay. 411. Four, one, one. Hmm. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. The Messenger of Allah uh, said the man is entitled to be sick. If he went out and returned, he is even more entitled to it. Very good. Okay. Somebody is sitting, Sheikh Zubair is sitting, listening to others. Then I go for a while, for a toilet or something. When I come back, I'm supposed to sit there. So if I come back, i suppose not to find anyone sitting in my place. But if I find, can I tell someone to move? I was sitting here. Can, but better not. Better not. Someone is sitting there, no need to. Especially with the Muslims of today. Tida, Ada, Adab, Jahil. No Adab and Jahil. You tell them, uh, I was sitting here, there, there could be a fight. But let's say somebody came and saw you sitting there, and then you went to the toilet, and when you came back, that person was sitting there. He should, he should withdraw because you came back. You came back. All right? These things happen actually in crowded places like Mecca and Medina, Masajid, uh, when people are, mashallah, surrounding ulama and learning from them. And like you, everybody sitting in his or her Zoom, hiding behind your laptops or cell phones thinking, MashaAllah, at least better than nothing. No problem. Let me not discourage you. Morning classes. You're supposed to be all around the Sheikh. Positive energy also. Allah will put so much energy in us. When you meet, when good people meet good people, there is something called positive energy. You need a sheikh who fears Allah, and you need a friend who fears Allah in life. In life, you need these two. A sheikh who can teach you, he or she fears Allah. Sheikh, sheikha, alim. The second one, you need also a good friend. Nasih, a friend who advises you love you so much that he or she always advise you. Just for the sake of Allah. These two, make sure you have them in life. A good alim to return to, number one to teach you and to return to in case you run into some issues. Second one, good friend. A friend who can advise you. Really, from the bottom of his or her heart. Not many, one or two, but not many. Okay, so the man is entitled to his seat, even more so if he comes back. If he comes back, he should be sitting there. Majlis of ilmu or social gathering, family. I'm not talking about traveling, okay? All right. One more hadith, sister Asmi, 412. 
Okay. Narrated Abdullah ibn Amr, the messenger of Allah said, it is not lawful for a man to separate two people and sit between them without their permission. Okay. Very, very good. Very okay. good. It is not permitted for a person to separate two people without the, and sit between them without the permission. They don't want. They want to sit near each other. Don't say, no, I need to pray here. No, mister. My shoulder is touching this man's shoulder. You cannot come and separate us. Two sisters are sitting. Somebody cannot come and sit between them. Not good. And look what the Prophet said. It is not lawful. You know what does it mean? It's haram. There is another haram that many Muslims never heard of, never talk about, which is to separate two people. We talk about, if I tell you, give me haram, most of you will say zina, lying, shirk, uh, riba. Okay, how about separating two Muslims? In a majlis, let alone separating husband and wife, separating brother and sister, separating mother and daughter, father and son. What is this? There are people just separating people, especially through sihr. Na'udhu billah. People do sihr so that a husband hates his wife, the wife hates her husband. Partners, two brothers doing business together and they're happy. Two sisters doing business together and they're happy. Suddenly you hear puff. Wow, what happened? Mm. You got it? Okay. 413, Sister Alina. 413. Assalamualaikum, Chef. Walaikum Assalam. Rather, whenever the Messenger of Allah وسلم, left a gathering, he used to make the following invocation. O oh Allah, divide for us the fear what debars us from the acts of disobedience and from the acts of obedience that admit us into your paradise and firm faith that discard the misfortune of life. O oh Allah, let us have sound health, hearing, and sight sight as long as you are as long as you grant us life O oh Allah let our enemies be revenged and defeated by you and grant us victory against them O oh Allah let us uh, let our misfortune be not in our religion let Amin. life be not be not our utmost concern and do not make him that oppresses us overpower us I mean this dua is very, very important. Allahumma qsim lana min khashyati kama tahulu bihi baynana wa bayna ma'asiyati. Wa min al-yaqini ma tubalighuna bihi jannatak. Beautiful dua Rasulullah s.a.w. used to make, which is, O oh Allah, divide for us of fear what debars us from the acts of disobedience. O oh Allah, put so much fear in our hearts that we will never... Uh, sin. We don't want to do acts of disobedience. Give us that fear, taqwa. So that even if our nafsu is strong, shaitan is strong, that fear will stop us. Like a strong, good brakes. You need brakes to control a speedy car. A, a strong car with a big engine, look at the, the type of brakes. Not any brakes like fast cars, they need strong brakes. Otherwise, that car, only a wall or a tree can stop it, or a rock, na'udhu billah. Oh Allah, put so much fear in our hearts to the extent that we will never sin. That's very important one. The second one, and from the acts of obedience that admit us into your paradise. And grant us, Ya Allah, so many good deeds that we end up in paradise. Make it easy for us to obey you. Make it easy for us. And of firm faith that discards the fortunes of life. 
give us so much faith that we will not feel bad if we miss anything. Give me so much faith, Ya Allah, to the extent that I will never feel, for example, sad for not having that job, job that pays very well. It didn't come, so what is the problem? I wanted to marry so-and-so, it didn't work. So I wanted to do business, it didn't materialize. I wanted to go to this university, but it's okay. Huh? Oh Allah, let us have sound health, hearing and sight. Good health, ya Allah, good hearing and good sight, as long as you grant us life. Oh Allah, let our enemies be revenged and defeated by you. Ya Rab, we, some of our enemies, we can't, we can't really face them. Huh? Like Orang Yahudi now, they're so strong. Orang American, Orang Russia, or, ya, Allah, ya Allah, take care of them. You are more powerful than them. Yeah? Oh Allah, grant us Victory against them. O oh Allah, let our misfortune be not in our religion. Ya Allah, never test us in our religion. Let life be not our utmost concern. This dunya, we don't want it to be priority. And do not make him that oppresses us overpower us. Ya Allah, whoever wants to oppress us, don't let him overpower us. If anybody is full enough, foolish enough to oppress us, never give him victory over us. Like some so-called, so-called between brackets, Muslim leaders, like in Syria, in Egypt, like in UAE, like in many Muslim countries, na'udhu billah, where they do sujood to the king, like in Morocco, they do rukur to the king. Astaghfirullah ghafur rahim. Shirk. Rukur and sujood is only for Allah. You should never bow in rukur or sujood except to Allah. There is this great scholar by the name of Abu Bakr al-Baqillani. Rahimahullah. I want to tell you his story, amazing story. Abu Bakr al-Baqillani was the chief judge of the Abbasid empire. The chief judge, do you know what does it mean chief judge? Not in Malaysia, chief judge of, uh, from uh, China to Morocco. That, that was the Muslim Ummah. Abu Bakr al-Baqillani is one of the greatest scholars of Usul al-Fiqh. And he was at the same time the chief judge. Caesar, the Roman emperor, invited him to talk to him. When he went, Caesar said, put the entrance low. Low, I know the Muslims will not bow to me. The Muslims don't bow to me. I want to humiliate him and make him bow to me, but he will not do it. So make the entrance, you know, instead of two meters, make it 150 meters. So that when he comes, he does like this. Imagine, sisters and brothers, imagine, this is the entrance. So I will just walk like this, right? But if the entrance is like this, what do I do? When I walk to you, I do this. Caesar said that that is enough for me because I know he will not bow to me. So his architect came and quickly built that. Abu Bakr al-Baqillani, because Quran and Hadith, knowledge, he understood what Caesar wants to do. You know what he did? He entered the reverse. He, he showed him his butt. Of course, covered. Takbir. He entered like this, reverse. <laughs> Faham. So never do that with Sheikh Zubair. 
because I will do that even worse. Why you want to humiliate Alim? Khalas, people don't, don't bow to you. Why you want people to? Ampon, ampon. In Islam, no. Respect for our leadership, but not to bow. Bowing is only to Allah. If I was in their place, I would say, don't do that. Don't do that to me. It's only to Allah. Sister Osnaini, one to one, chapter one to one. I'm sorry, she. I don't have the book. Okay, and still, mashallah, so follow sorry. us. May Allah bless I'm you. Thinking. Very good. Yes, I'm following. <laughs> very good, very good. I'm proud of you. Who is who did the read yet? Ah, Sister Farina. Uh, one, two, one. Chapter Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Chapter 121 about vision and what is related to it and among his signs is your sleep by night and by day and your seeking of his bounty verily in that are indeed signs for a people who listen hadith this is ayah this is ayah now hadith the messenger of allah sallallahu alaihi narrated by abu huraira radiyallahu anhu the messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "At the end of time, the believer's vision will often come true. The most truthful believer will have the most truthful vision, and the believer's dream is one part of forty-six parts of prophethood. Dreams are of three kinds: a righteous dream is a good tidings from Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The sad dream." Sorry. A righteous dream is a good tidings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The sad dream is from Satan and the dream that one indulges himself in. Thus, if one of you saw what he dislikes, let him get up, spit symbolically to the left, and let him not tell people about it. I love fetters and hate yokes. For a fetter means feet fixed in the religion, refraining one from doing evil. Narrated Obada Ibn. Alas. Yes. Yeah. Uh, hadith. 414. Okay. 414. 414. Okay. Thank you. She wants to take advantage of the situation and read more. Takbir. So this hadith about ru'ya. Ru'ya means dream. What you see in your dream. Number one, Allah says in Surah Ar-Rum, وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ مَنَامُكُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ Among his signs, your sleep during day and during the night. You sleep during the night and you sleep sometimes during the day and you see dreams. That's a sign that God really exists because who makes you see dream? You sleep. If there was no God, you see nothing. Think about it, think about it. If any idiot atheist tell you, I don't believe in God, I say, come, who makes you see things when you are dead? You're dead already, sleeping is death. Yet you see dream, good or bad. Who is doing that? Who is, you are asleep, you are asleep. You are asleep. Who makes you see those things and remember them? And then come and tell us what you saw. There must be a God. Allah Azza wa Jal, one God. For those who say there is no God, tell them why, why do you see sleep, uh, dreams? A dream is a proof that God exists. Otherwise, how do you see when your eyes are closed? Look at me, look at me. Now I close my eyes. I'm not seeing the screen. I'm seeing nothing. 
How come I see something when not only my eyes are closed, my brain has shut down? Because sleep means your brain shuts down. That's why you fall asleep. Your ear don't hear nothing. And you are seeing things and hearing things. And you come, when you wake up, you tell us what you saw and what you heard. Who made you hear and see? Allah. He will make you hear and see in the grave. He will make you and see when you meet him, Yawm al Qiyamah. And you're still saying there is no life after death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, and among his signs is your sleep by night and by day, and your seeking of his bounties. During the day, you go work, travel, work, you know, do business. That's a sign that Allah is taking care of you. Verily, in that are indeed signs for people who listen. Then the hadith came, narrated by Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu, that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam said, at the end of time, like now, the dream of one of you will come true. The most truthful believer will have the most truthful vision. According to your iman, you see visions. I told my wife two, three days ago, I've seen three or four graves, three, four people so far died. I told her, I saw in my dream, three, four, may Allah have mercy on us. I don't know who's going to die. Sister Farida, the, husband's, the husband of the friend of Sister Farina, a cousin lately, who, who else? Ah, Sister Jeannie's brother-in-law. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. Allahu Akbar. Sister Osnaini, your, your mic is on. Mute it. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I just heard the motorbike. Man. <laughs> malish, malish. Malish, malish. Mafi. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. You know Arabic. Very good. Very good. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> so the most truthful, may Allah make us truthful, you start seeing vision and it happens. And the believer's dream is one part of 46 part of prophethood. The prophethood has 46 plus. One of them is dream. The dream comes true. So you are not a prophet. You are like a prophet. You start seeing things and they happen exactly as you saw them. Dreams are of three kinds. A righteous dream is a good tiding from Allah. If you see something good, you see yourself in Mecca, reading Quran, dhikr, you see Rasulullah, it, it means you are a good person and it's from Allah. And a sad dream is from Shaitan. If you see something very sad, very evil, very hazan, it brings pain to your heart, that's from shaitan. Shaitan came and disturbed you. And the dream that one indulges himself in, you see yourself in ni'ma, uh, enjoying something. So there are three types of dream. Dream from Allah, dream from shaitan, and dream from your own self. Subconscious, your, your nafsu is telling you things. If you don't like what you see, spit three times on your left. Like this, symbolically. Look. <coughs> don't spit on the partner who is near you. And <coughs> say, the hadith, I'm practicing the hadith. Takbir. Ah, don't say I'm practicing the hadith. You are spitting on your partner. You, it's your chance to take revenge from him or her for what they have done to you lately. Takbir. Symbolically. And if your partner is on the left, be careful, don't. Get up somewhere and do that. And Rasulullah said, 
turn the other side. Yeah, even during the day. If I am sleeping like this and I see something scary, when I get up, I spit here. And change, change position, continue sleeping. Sister Farina said, even during daytime? Yes, even during daytime. Because some scary dreams also happen during daytime, after Fajr, between Dohra and Asr. Yes. After. Yes, could be from Allah, could be from Shaitan, it's okay, could be from the nafs. Yeah. Anyways, if you see something bad, don't say it. Something bad, you see something, somebody killing you, you see yourself committing uh, sexual intercourse with someone who is not your spouse, he or she, don't say. Don't say. Don't say, I saw myself sleeping with that. Don't say. Actually, there is an interpretation for that. Uh, one woman came to Abdul Rahman Ibn Sirin, the greatest scholar so far who interpreted dreams. His name is Abdul Rahman Ibn Sirin, Rahimahullah. And she was so malu to ask him about this dream that she keeps seeing. He encouraged her, he said, sister, if you want me to explain, you tell me. She said, I'm very shy, yeah, Sheikh. He said, just go ahead. So finally, she found some courage and she told him, I see myself sleeping with all men of Baghdad. All men of Baghdad. The Sheikh, to her shock, she thought the Sheikh will, will scold her. He said, Allahu Akbar. You, you see that? Once, she said many times. He said, by Allah, tell me what good you do. She said, I don't do it. He said, no. People who see this type of dream, they, see a they do a lot of good. What good you do? She said, yeah, Sheikh, I give a lot of sadaqah to the poor man. Poor man. I give a lot of sadaqah. He said, keep doing so. So not every dream you see is evil, even when you see yourself. Because to her, it was interpretation of the pleasure she gets, the dua she gets from them. But shaitan, may Allah curse him, brings that dream as if she is having sexual intercourse with those men. Until, alhamdulillah, she no more saw that. She continued doing good. Faham. But you don't go and tell. You see yourself drowning, dying. Don't go and tell. Except somebody you trust. One, maybe one or two. But don't go tell. I've seen myself jumping from uh, Petronas Twin Towers. Don't say that. I see myself burning in fire. I don't, don't say that. Say, Audubillah spit three times huh? and change the position of your sleep. Change the position. If you were sleeping on the right, sleep on the left. If your head was like this, try your head this way. These are the other. So we stop here, inshallah. We continue with you with next hadith, which is five, uh, 415. Insha'Allah ta'ala. Okay, so mark it, especially Sister Zurina, so that she reminds us next week, inshallah. Any question before I go? Any question? Okay, encourage your friends to watch this recording, especially those who are still on the mood of Hari Raya. La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah. ربنا آتنا في الدنيا حسنة وفي الآخرة حسنة وقنا عذاب النار سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون السلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم